Welcome back to the channel, everybody. Hope you're all doing good. Here we are already into the month of May. I think we've all had a chance to get to the track at least once, hopefully more. Hopefully your race season's going good for you. I know personally, I'm gearing up, getting ready. I ran into some valve train issues on my car because I made a, a choice because of parts availability. I used lash caps. That was a bad choice. I knew it going in. Fortunately for me, the parts I needed came back into stock, so that's all gotten fixed. Valve lash has gotten done for the 17th time, and hopefully it'll go to the dyno this weekend. We'll see. Maybe lay down some more power. We're not going to talk about that, though. The focus of today's episode is going to be on boost control with a four-port solenoid. Now, if you remember, we touched on it briefly. We didn't really get into details. The first episode in boost control had to do with how some stock ECUs run it. Then we went to some standalones. Then we had some practical examples in episode three. So we're going to talk specifically about the four port solenoid. Now the theory applies to those of you that can run dual three port solenoids in your standalone. Because as you're about to see, really the advantage is we can run a really low wastegate spring and until we get into a situation where we have lots of back pressure we can hold the wastegate shut because we're going to bleed from the bottom port and add to the top port so theoretically up the spring pressure now this also is technically how co2 works in use co2 is a little bit different we're not going to cover that today uh, primarily because i don't have enough time and I've never actually used it in practice, so we'll we'll work into that. So let's go to a four port. I'm going to switch to a diagram here that D Sport has, probably courtesy of Turbo Smart or somebody that's selling a, a Max solenoid. There are a couple different options. Turbo Smart obviously has one. A company called Steam Speed has one. Theirs is a little bit different in layout than this as far as where the A, B exhaust and inlet are, but they all work the same. So as you can see, we have the red line. We have 30 pounds of supply pressure. Now, as we start to bias the boost, that is increase the wastegate duty cycle, it starts to go more towards the A and less towards the B. The B ends up going towards the vent. So the exhaust or filter or whatever you're, you're running. Solenoid in real life looks something like this. It's probably not going to really be in focus very well, but you can kind of see what you got. Same idea. So as we start to add to the top, let's say, for instance, my car, we have a six pound spring in it. And then we start to add boost to the top. So 35 pounds. As the duty cycle goes above 50%, it starts to bleed more and more from the bottom port, and more is going directly to the top port. So that 6 pounds turns into 12, it turns into 13, it turns into 20. Until we achieve a back pressure issue, we're always going to be able to run the diameter of the diaphragm plus the, the ratio between that and the valve plus the boost and the spring to counter EMAP. So for, as an, exa as an example, I'm 1.25 to one back pressure right now and 54% duty cycle to get uh, 35 pounds. We're gonna switch to that here in a second. Plumbing, very easy. You can search, you can find this anywhere on Google. Getting it hooked up correctly should not be a big deal. Now, you do need to look at the solenoid because Mac does have different versions of this. The intake exhaust A and B might be flopped left to right, upside down, doesn't matter. You still are going to hook it up to the same spot and then feed the same port on the wastegate. Just knowing that this is how it needs to be regardless of where they're actually located on the solenoid is very, very important because otherwise you could cause engine damage. Best case scenario is you do it completely backwards and you end up on wastegate line and can't do anything. Okay, so let's switch to practical example. We're going to 
open infinity software we're going to see a couple of things this is the 1200 horse pass so as i like to do i have it at peak power because that's going to illustrate a few things 8600 rpm actual manifold pressure was 325 kpa the gasoline afr equivalent is 912 coolant temps 192 16 degrees of timing things we've already gone over boost target was 320 and so while it shows an error of 13.7 that's just because it was moving through spikes and valleys and it was probably 330 before and that's why it said that it was 13 kpa too high we can see the base duty cycle is 54.4 the pids which i have paired way down only pulled 0.2% and did so slowly. So we ended up with 54.2% total to get to 325 kPa. Now, I do this math in my head really easy. We'll switch to PSI, make it easier on people here in the US. So 33 pounds. Great. Now we're going to talk about a few of the functions that it requires to use closed loop boost on a four port. When I first tried this, it was very, very impossible. I didn't even attempt it. Now when I normally do one of these, these values here, the boost proportional, the derivative, and the integral, I'll run almost four times higher than that. Three times for sure. Um, my numbers are like 130.08 right here, 0, 0.008, so that one's chopped way down. And then this one is usually 280. So that is the total adjustment range and speed. So I wanted it to be really, really slow. I was going to use the actual duty to cycle table over here. I do have two that combine. So this is two. So as you can see here, this is 27 or so. Obviously the first table is adding to that. I was doing some tinkering and came up with an idea and this is what I ended up with. Not necessarily the best, not necessarily the worst, but how I'm doing it right now at least. So when you go to set up a four port, if your ECU doesn't have PID control and you can't change the frequency that it's working at, you're going to have to leave it in open loop. So I'm going to give you some basic closed loop settings that I'm going to work on the next time the car is on the dyno to improve the rate of change and the maximum change that it can do. So we have some base PID values, as you can see. It's 033, 065, 001. That's what it is in AEM numbers. I believe Hall Tech basically would be 33, 65, and 1. Um, or 330, 650, and 10. I can't recall. But anyway, everybody's using basically the same concept. The, the same split. Now, we're going to switch to the output control tab real fast because it's going to show you the frequency that I'm running this at. Low side one is boost control. Now normally a three port runs at 32 or 33 hertz. That's pretty average. That's the update speed that it's going to operate at. So this is 10 times per second. 32 is 32 times per second. That's, that's what that really truly translates to. So I've knocked that down a third of what a three port would be. Now, I have full closed loop control. It's slow, but it's a race car, so I don't care if it overshoots a little bit. It rarely undershoots. So if we slow things down, if you have that capability, for instance, stock-based ECU stuff like Honda, you can change the hertz. You can't change the PIDs. You don't have that, but you can definitely slow the thing way down to, to try to make it work a little bit more... Uh, What's the word I want here? Less touchy. A little bit easier to use. Now if we go back to the PIDs, 
it might be that what I end up doing is I double these numbers very most likely is where I'm going to start. Um, maybe I only increase them by 50%. Maybe maybe I put them back to where they're going to be for a three port and I just run lower uh, frequency update. The hertz range is going to be lower. Haven't quite decided on that. But this is a good starting point. This works. So what I'm going to do here is trace through. And if you watch this right here, these, these three numbers, this is w what it's doing for the base duty, the actual amount it's using, and where it's controlling. So if we scroll through real s slow, you can see, oh, it ended up going a little faster, you can see that as it comes up to target, it starts to get where I want it. Ignore the boost error. Now that it's in PSI, it looks really, really strange. Um, it did overshoot, though. So it's overshooting by four pounds. And as you can see, in, in that amount of time, it's been overshooting for a while. But it's just been real slow to react. In fact, it's too slow because we do want to try to keep our target matching the actual. So... What I can see here is that I have too much duty cycle in it for a given PSI. Great. We'll, we'll get that fixed the next time it's on the dyno. But you can see how slow it's really truly reacting. It's allowing it to overboost. Then finally it realizes, oh hey, I, I finally whittled myself down. I should start pulling. And so then it's barely pulling. Now some of that is because it doesn't have much range in the PID. Tuning PIDs can be very temper temperamental for the uninitiated. Not impossible. Just take some time. Take some patience. Starting off with a known good and dividing it, working it up slow. One thing that you can see is the way I have this is very progressive so that it's not adding much down here. I had to do that because originally AEM didn't have a boost feedback ignore um, so you could get boost spikes. You could get some crazy spikes because it was 100%, let's say, duty cycle, where you only really wanted it to be 30 down low down here, as a, an example, let's say. So it was a technique to soften that up instead of running the same value all the way across. Typically on a three port, you can run the same value all the way straight across. So we covered this briefly. We covered the plumbing, we covered the PID settings, we covered the, the update speed. And that's another thing. I might end up coming in here and changing this to 15 hertz. Slowly speeding it up so that it's open time and close time, which are equally important. So it's venting, it's not venting. It's going to be able to do that a little bit faster. I'm going to get a little bit more precise control. Uh, in the example of my car, that's probably the first thing I'm going to do. And then I will start to slowly bring up the PIDs. And just because I had mentioned it, if you were using an Infinity, you can go to Setup Wizard. You can go to Boost Control. And then you have all the PID tables here also. You have duty cycle, you have the, the maximum that it's going to use to clamp, this one right here. Boost feedback, enable, below, error. So it has to be within 10 kPa, in this case, before it starts to use the, the feedback. Otherwise, it'll stay open loop. And the, the explanation is pretty good. Boost feedback, enable, below, error, allows for open loop boost control during spool up, until MAP in KPA is within the range of the current boost target. Low values below 20 KPA are recommended to help avoid overshooting the boost target when the turbo spools. So 10 KPA, 1.45 PSI for the non-metrics. Basically what that will let us do is that it might run 33% duty cycle down here. You can take and set all these values the same all in this case the 065 straight across it doesn't matter if you do it 
down low or not because it's not going to use that until it gets within 10 kPa or 7 kPa or whatever value you choose. Anyway, that sums up four port tuning. The rest of it is what you're used to. You just set up a wastegate duty cycle table and a boost target table and whammo kablammo you have a, a running car that's making some power. If you like this content, if you know somebody who does, please recommend it. Please consider subscribing, hitting the like button. If you want live updates, click on the bell and you will get updated as uh, information is added, as videos are added pictures when I get to that point. Uh, and I appreciate your guys' support. We're up to 360 viewers, and, and really it's allowed me to know that this is something that you guys enjoy uh, as a whole. I'm getting a lot of feedback in the, in the comments section, so I really appreciate all of that. I'm trying to make it a little bit more professional. I know that it's being filmed in a bedroom, so it's going to be limited on that, but Hopefully we get the information across, which is the most important part. So thanks again, guys. I hope you're all doing good. Take care.